All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our worship service uh, for this Sunday, the third Sunday in Advent. And uh, before we get going in worship, I do have a few announcements to share with you. Next Sunday, next Sunday, we will be having our, um, it'll be a live stream concert. It'll be our traditional mountain music concert. And uh, we do this um, every year. It started off as me just trying to figure out a way to give everybody a break the Sunday before Christmas. Turned out everybody really likes having a break before Christmas. And so we've continued that tradition. So that will be next Sunday at 11 and it will be live streamed uh, from the sanctuary. So you'll be able to go to the church website to watch that and just take that as a time uh, to relax and to be with each other um, before the, uh, the the oncoming craziness that will be Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve, we will be having our drive-through love feast. It's going to be from six to eight, and it's going to be awesome. Um, you know, there's we're trying to make this Christmas Eve as close as we can make it to what it would be like if we were in the sanctuary. And so there's all sorts of Christmas decorations. We've got um, four or five different types of music that's going to be going on. And of course, we'll be passing out our buns, coffee and candles. And so um, if you need something to do or want something to do on Christmas Eve, um, we we could still use about all the help we can get. Uh, we're going to need help sort of shuffling people out who are um, directing traffic. Um, and just it'd be, it'd be helpful to have a couple of bodies just sort of floating around. So that way we can, you know, if something comes up that we can um, have that for help. So if you want to help on Christmas Eve, if you'll let myself or Nancy Miller know, and we will plug you in for that. Also, if you are participating in our God is in the manger study, um, I invite you to keep following along and the video for that will be posted on Facebook and on our YouTube page uh, tomorrow afternoon. And I think that, yeah, those are all my, oh, oh of course. Uh, today we will be celebrating Holy Communion. So um, you will need to get some sort of bread uh, and some sort of juice. And in the Moravian church, we practice open communion, meaning that anybody who is uh, a lover of Jesus and wants to come to the table is welcome. So we start off our time of worship with um, prayer requests. We mentioned uh, Tony Beecham. So if you keep Tony in your, in your prayers, as well as Charlotte, that's Robin and Mug's daughter, uh, the Sparks family, and Doris Sloan. If you will keep them in your weekly prayers. Let's pray together. God, we gather together this day to proclaim you. We gather together today to worship you. We pray now that the words that we sing and the words that we say, that they might bring comfort, peace, joy, and inspiration to us. Lord, we ask that you continue to be with all of those who are in need, who are um, weakened in the body or the mind or the spirit. Lord, we pray that you will make your place in their hearts and that you will uh, remind us um, that whenever we ask that you were there, I would pray that that might bring us comfort as we continue to pray to you with the things that are on our hearts. Lord, we pray that this Advent season continue to lift us. Lord, continue to um, open our hearts and prepare the way for you to come to us this Christmas. We ask that you continue to um, show us all those places in our lives which cause us to struggle when it comes to a relationship with you. And we ask that you give us the peace and the strength and the courage to uh, deal with those places as we move forward to Christmas. God, we give you thanks for the promise that even when it seems so very, very dark, that light is coming. Even when it seems like there is nothing that is going right, light is coming. We pray that that image and that truth be seared into our hearts and our minds, because that's something that we desperately need to hold on to right now. God, we give you thanks for that truth. We give you thanks for the gift of your son, which makes that truth so near, dear, and real to us. For it's in his holy name we pray. Amen. Now, I invite you to join with me in singing our opening hymn this morning, Hail to the Lord's Anointed. 
So now I invite you to join me uh, in reading responsively Psalm 126 and what's called Mary's Magnificat. This is found in uh, Luke, the first chapter, verses 46 through 55. And what's so um, so cool about this is that um, in that time, whenever uh, Mary has just found out that she's going to give birth to Jesus and she goes to see uh, Elizabeth, this is part of the conversation that ensues after Elizabeth says, you know, this is this is such a special thing that is happening to you. And that's the second part of our responsive reading today. So won't you join with me in reading these responsibly? When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we rejoiced. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the Negev. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has with his own. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants. Amen. Now I invite you to join me in singing our next hymn, Come, O Long Expected Jesus. 
The first piece of scripture that we have comes to us from Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 4, and then 8 through 11. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn to provide those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. And then verses 8 through 11. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations, and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are the people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exalt in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown to be into it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. And then from John, chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, and then verses 19 through 28. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And then they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Then they said to him, well, who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I'm the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now, they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, why then are you baptizing if you are neither the, neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, 
Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I'm not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. So um, we have here three different self-denials of John the Baptist. Well, not really self-denials, but denials of John the Baptist. And I want to take just a little bit of time with each of them. Hey, John, are you the Messiah? We know at this point in time within the nation of Israel, there was this expectation for a Messiah. Why was that? Well, we have this good old prophecy, and actually, really, there were prophecies, but the main one that comes to mind is from Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. And I'll spare, I'll spare you the whole chapter, but it is chock full of images that we associate with Christ. But if we're being honest, we could also see them as being associated with John the Baptist. Just take a listen to the description of what the Messiah is going to look like. This comes from Isaiah chapter 53, verses 2 through 4. For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of a dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in, in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, and as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne all of our affinities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. Now, you didn't have an understanding of who Jesus is, which these people didn't, on that description alone, which, if you remember, um, if you are a member of the Sanhedrin, that's the group of Jewish leaders who is questioning Jesus right now, you are very aware of that prophecy. If you all of a sudden see this man who is wearing nothing but clothes of camel hair and leather belt, he's got a scruffy beard, and he eats nothing but uh, locusts and wild honey, and all he seems to do is go around preaching about God and baptizing. If you're one of those religious leaders and you see this man and you hear him and you are ready for the Messiah to come, yeah, based off of that description and the prophecy, you might think that this is the guy. But John says, nope, I'm not him. All right. Hey, John, are you Elijah? This comes from 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11. As they continued walking and talking, this is Elijah and his son Elisha, a chariot of fire and horses uh, separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. So you take that verse. Then add the first part of 2 Chronicles 21, 12, which says a letter came from the prophet Elijah, and you have the knowledge that what happened in 2 Chronicles happened after he had been taken up in the clouds. All of a sudden, you have this idea that Elijah actually never died. So at this point in time, in the minds of most of the people in Israel, Elijah is simply hanging out up there with God. Now combine that belief with the physical description that we have of Elijah, who is a hairy man who, get, who wears, guess, you guessed it, a big leather belt. All of a sudden, this picture starts to come up. You see this man who is dressed like Elijah, who never died, and is saying stuff that sounds a whole lot like Elijah. If these guys, sure, if this guy isn't the Messiah, surely he is Elijah. John says, "Nope, I'm not him." All right, hey John, are you the prophet? Deuteronomy chapter eighteen, verses eighteen through nineteen says, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who, which, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words of that prophet uh, shall speak uh, the, the words that the prophet speaks in my name. I myself will hold accountable. So the Jewish leaders who are questioning John would have known this prophecy for a prophet. And when they hear what 
uh, the John, uh, in, when they have John in front of them, who looks like or is even a little less like a normal guy, and they hear what he's saying about repenting and the coming of the Lord, then maybe this is the prophet. Nope. John says, I'm not him. Now, I find these three exchanges fascinating, and fascinating for a couple of reasons. The first thing that interests me is that these people are desperate. They are desperate for John to either be the Messiah, Elijah, or the foretold prophet. They are desperate for John to be something that he is not. Now, I don't know why, but if I were to put myself in their shoes, there are a lot of reasons I could see wanting John to be these things. Maybe it's because um, they're excited for a sign from God that things are about to change. Maybe they're tired of the way things are, or maybe they're just ready for something new. Maybe, maybe it's because their understanding and practice of their own faith had gotten so far away from what it should be that deep down their souls were needing a completely different orientation. And if all of a sudden, if this is John, then hey, things are turning around. Things are going to get better. And whether it be desire or something deeper, or maybe it's even like what Paul describes as a deep yearning to reach out and grasp at God. If John is any one of the three of these people, it's a good thing. And it's a, it, it inspires all sorts of positive things. And don't we all understand that feeling? Not a single one of us has said 2020 has been an awesome year and we're just sad to see it go. We all know what it's like to want things to be different. And we all know what it's like to perhaps project those hopes onto things or people because if they are what we think they are, they're a sign of things that are going to get better. So we understand that and we feel that. We know how the religious leaders are feeling. We know how uh, perhaps just the people in general are feeling when John comes on the scene. So we can understand that. The other thing that fascinates me is how easy, how easy it would be for John to say, yeah, I'm him. I'm the Messiah. Yeah, I'm Elijah. Or yeah, I'm the prophet. And if we're honest, perhaps we know what that feels like too to want to accept glory, honor, prestige, title, whatever, that people want to bestow on us, or to put it another way. Perhaps we know what it's like to want to take that glory, honor, prestige, that's so easily just hanging out there from the people who deserve it. And this is, this is nothing new. Uh, if you feel that way, you are not, uh, you are not the, uh, uh, the, uh, the only person who feels that way because there are all sorts of examples throughout this happening throughout history three like thomas edison took credit for the light bulb when it was joseph swan who invented it first or harry truman took credit for ending the war with japan by dropping the atomic bombs but most credible historians say that it was actually the threat of russia invading japan which led to their surrender or most is who took credit from homer simpson for creating the drink the flaming homer it's nothing new for us to want to take credit when it's not due. We know what that's like as well. So we know what it's like to want something to happen. We know what it's like to have a desire to want to take on more glory, honor, prestige, whenever people want to easily leave it out there, bestow it upon us. And then we have what John actually says. No, I'm not any of those. And it's not just that I'm not any of those. All I am is a voice. And yeah, I'm using the same words that Isaiah uh, had said that a prophet would say, but I am just a voice. My whole purpose is to tell you to get your heart ready, to clear out all of the things that are going to inhibit your ability to connect with God. And by the way, the one who is coming, I'm not even wor worthy enough to touch his feet, which is actually an ironic statement because um, John is taking the form of utmost humility before God who is coming into the world. And when God comes into the world, it is in the most humble way as a refugee uh, infant who lays in the thing that the animals eat out of. 
even though John could bring a sense of comfort to the people who are seeking it and bring a sense of a claim to himself and perhaps thus propel what he is trying to say, he doesn't do it. He does the opposite. He equates himself to nothing more than a voice that doesn't say anything about himself. You know, and I gave you a list of people who have um, done, you know, taken credit. Then when I think about what John's answer is, I actually think about um, Chris Christopherson. Now, I hope that y'all know who he is. And if you don't, um, this is a guy, there's a lot of stuff that he's known for. Like, for instance, Chris Christopherson had a fantastic career in the Army. He actually turned down an opportunity to teach at West Point. He's in a bunch of movies. He was in The Convoy. He was in a movie called Convoy. He was in the original A Star is Born. He was in The Blade, all three of the trilogy. He's got 115 acting credits on his IMDb page. But what stands out to me most about Chris Christopherson in the relation to John the Baptist and what the message for Advent is, is his music career. Now, if you don't know him by, by now, you, you will know some of the songs that he wrote. He wrote songs like Me and Bobby McGee. Um, he wrote the song Help Me Make It Through the Night. And probably one of his most famous songs that somebody else recorded is he's the one who wrote the Johnny Cash song, Sunday Morning Coming Down. But another thing that he's known for in his music is that when he was starting to get a huge amount of success in music and songwriting, he became aware of another young songwriter and he was mesmerized by this guy. So much so that when he did interviews, he would talk about this new guy and when and he would tell people you need to go see him and when people would say things like hey you're a you're you're a great songwriter he would say well you need to go check out this new guy named John Prine because compared to him i am nothing he did this on his own accord with no suggestion or compensation from John Prine at all and chris christopherson really jump started the career of a person whose music career overshadowed Christopherson's own music career, he jump-started the career of one of the most famous songwriters who have ever lived, all because instead of being who people wanted him to be, and instead of taking the glory where it was not near as due, he became a voice for something greater. And that's such an important lesson that we have in Advent. In our own lives, we perhaps have these we definitely have these temptations and we have these desires that the temptations play on to be our own hope and to take credit for things which we really don't reserve credit for. And in doing so, we cease to be that voice for something greater. You know, when we overestimate our own abilities, when we become eager to grab the credit or claim that be so easy to do, stop being the voice for others to hear and we stop being the voice that we need to hear we become our own stumbling blocks to an uninhibited relationship with god or to put it in terms of the prophecy uh, when we cease to be that voice when we allow ourselves to build ourselves up and accept you know glory acclaim whatever that's not ours we're putting more curves in that road and we're making it more bumpy. It's a little bit harder to achieve a straight road whenever we do that. Now, to be fair, it needs to be said, there's nothing wrong with self-confidence and being self-assured. That's something that we all need. But where it becomes a problem is when we turn it up to 11 and in doing so, convince ourselves that we are the ones who create our own salvation, both in the life to come and the life we live right now. And honestly, I mean, that's where the greatest struggle is. It's the life right here and now, because for the most part, we all know about salvation and how it comes from um, through Jesus Christ only. That's not the thing that really causes us to struggle in the sense that we're talking about today. Where we sometimes uh, forget and what we struggle with is that, you know, there's this whole life before um, before our death and being in heaven, which a relationship with Jesus can greatly impact. And to be honest, it's pretty easy to forget that because um, we, 
it, we have the basics down. We're good at, you know, feeding ourselves, sheltering ourselves, clothing ourselves. Um, but those, those don't really pose too much of a risk of inflating our self to a point that it hurts our relationship with God. It's all the other stuff. It's those extra things that we do, things that bring us joy, fulfillment, excitement, identity, purpose. We're really good at doing those things too. And those are the things which cause us to either consciously or subconsciously think that we're the sources of the most important things in our life. That's when we start to go down a curvy and bumpy road. That's whenever we cease to be that voice that we need to hear. Now, I'm not suggesting that we stop doing the things which are fun, which bring us joy. All I'm saying is that those things, they don't compare. They don't compare to the awesomeness that is living the way that Christ would have us to live. And uh, anytime I say something like this, I always point out, you know, if you want a concise list of how to do that, go to Matthew chapters five through seven and read it. I'm also saying that when we confuse the ability to do all of those things we like to do with the ability to lead a deeply meaningful life here on earth, which points to our faith in Jesus and which gets us um, ready and more aware of the life that we have to come, we're fooling and harming ourselves. Whenever we think that just because um, we're able to get through this life and enjoy it and do the things that we like to do, that that means that we have got life figured out and that we you know, have got all that life has to offer, we are fooling and harming ourselves. We are distorting that road back to God, which John is telling us to prepare. That's the importance of his message in Advent. It admonishes us to see ourselves honestly and to start clearing all of those obstructions to the road. Um, he, he's asking us to think about those you know, places um, where we create those things which keep us from uh, being able to, to see God coming or to, to uh, or have God as a part of our lives. And that all happens whenever we you know, think too much of ourselves and place too much, uh, too much uh, um, on our ability to do the things that we like to do. It's with that in mind that we come to the communion table today. Today, in the meal that we have, we are reminded of the power that comes through humility. Today in this meal, we are reminded that the one who is born in humility to save us dies in humility to save us. And in partaking in this holy meal, we become the voice that points to the all-powerful one. May we find healing and inspiration in this meal which is prepared for us today. So I invite you now to join with me in singing our next hymn.
I invite you now to get your uh, elements, your bread and your juice. Let's have a prayer. God, we thank you for this meal. We thank you for all that is on display in this meal. We pray that you will inspire us with its image. Help us to remember um, all that you are and all that you do for us and help it uh, help us to be inspired by this meal, to seek out all those places that uh, we put ourselves above you in our life. Lord, we pray that we might see those places and that this meal might inspire us to seek humility in all things. For it's in your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Now on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it. And then he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I invite you to partake. And then in the same way, after supper, our Lord Jesus took the cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You may pray. Now our Lord reminds us that as often as we eat from this bread and as often as we drink from this cup, we proclaim his death until he comes again. I hope that you are having a great Advent and I hope that this meal um, inspires you and works within you all of the things that, uh, that is from God. And I pray that you are eagerly looking forward to Christmas and the time that we'll share together on Christmas. And as you seek to find those places in your life that perhaps need straightening and flattening so that, that way uh, the road for the Lord is prepared. Or as you seek to put humility above all other things in your life, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious unto you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Like I say, I hope that y'all have a great rest of your day. Um...